Good morning. Thanks very much. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm going to go ahead and start my 50-minute timer because if I'm talking when that goes off, I'm just going to shut up because I'd rather have your questions. So um, that'll be my plan. Uh, we'll talk about, uh, as you heard, common dermatologic problems in kids. There are a lot of them. And if you guys see kids, you see a lot of skin stuff. And so I, my challenge was just picking the ones I thought you saw the most and asking myself the questions that I hear the most from my residents, from my trainees, from uh, providers in my area uh, when they call me. So that was sort of my, my mindset here. Let's see if I know how to advance the slides. Um, I am an investigator for several uh, of these drugs. Uh, those aren't on there. I'm a consultant for two companies who are trying to bring biologic medications to the pediatric population. So that, those are the questions they'd ask me and those are the questions I answer for them. I speak for one company, one company only, for a very good reason. That's for the company that makes Aquaphor. I'm not really going to spe specifically talk about Aquaphor for any reason. Um, but they're a company that has an amazing patient assistance program. And they've given Aquaphor for free to a litany of my ichthyosis patients who otherwise pay a fortune for it. And so they are near and dear to my heart, and I'm as biased as can be because of it. So <laughs> just, just so you know, if I say anything about Eucern or Aquaphor, I'll try not to because that's not fair. But that's why I speak for them and no one else. I also see only kids, uh, and I see mostly kids on Medicaid. So some of the newer drugs I'm going to talk about, I, I don't have a lot of experience with because my kids can't afford them. Uh, but I can certainly consume the literature and tell you as much as I know about them. So this was uh, sort of the method to my madness. Um, sort of what do I see? Um, uh, what's new? That's the name of this conference. So I, uh, I, was, I actually emailed Dr. Chua and was like, what, what should I focus on? There's a lot, a lot new just with eczema alone. We could talk about the new drugs for the whole hour, uh, which is an amazing place to be, actually. Um, but wanted to sort of balance what's new with sort of standard of care and things that you do every day and my bent on those. So that's sort of uh, where we'll go. Eczema is what I see the most of anything. Uh, uh, at all. Um, there are uh, studies that look at admitted kids at uh, pediatric hospitals uh, through the uh, emergency department and 86 percent of the patients admitted are due to either eczema flares or infections of eczema flares. So uh, knowing eczema is knowing a lot of pediatric dermatology. So we will spend some time there. Um, this is just a case we'll start with, a typical uh, moderately to severely affected child with um, really inflamed skin. Uh, you're asking yourself, is this infected? The answer is probably yes. Is it infected with staph? Is it infected with herpes? Um, those are sometimes harder questions to answer. And as I alluded, there's just been a ton uh, just in the past year alone with atopic dermatitis. When I uh, finished residency training uh, or fellowship training, I guess, in the year 2000, to 2017, there were that many new molecules for atopic dermatitis approved um, after uh, tacrolimus, protopic, uh, pimacrolimus, elidel. I'll say the brand names when I say the generics first, only the, and you guys can put me in CME jail if you have to, because if you don't know what I'm talking about, then it doesn't make a lot of sense. So I will only say them once, but I, I may say them, and that's the reason there. Um, but when tacrolimus and pimacrolimus were approved in 2000, then to 2017, nothing. Me too, topical steroids, things like that, but nothing else. Since 2017, when Dupixent, the only, only time I'll say that, Dupilumab was approved, um, there's been, just been an explosion of new drugs. So we'll talk a bit about uh, them. This is uh, the other area there's been a lot of change. Um, this is, um, I should, this is kind of a disclosure in a sense. I'm the co-chair of the committee that made these guidelines for the American Academy of Dermatology. And so I will, that doesn't matter here, this is just the data, but the next slide it will. This, these are the comorbidities associated with atopic dermatitis. The ones in green probably don't surprise you on that uh, far left-hand column, the, the atopic triad, right? Uh, you get eczema and food allergies as a child, you get asthma as a, or as an infant, asthma as a child and hay fever as an adult. You, some, some people march orderly through that progression. We've all known about that forever. On the far right, that probably doesn't surprise you. You see infections in kids with atopic dermatitis all the, all the time. Those other green ones might. Alopecia areata. If you thought, wow, I see a lot of kids with alopecia areata who actually also have bad eczema or vice versa. That's not a coincidence. Urticaria, probably not a surprise. Some of these others, on the other hand, osteoporosis, fractures, is that because we use a lot of steroids? Don't know. We, we, we will know that in 20 years because all these new non-steroidal treatments work so much better. So we're not going to use steroids as much anymore. So that question may get answered. But 
These other ones are uh, less clear, so the light will take uh, the ADH spectrum, since that's a nice segue from the talk you just had. You know, that's, uh, I'm jumping ahead to my next slide, but I just won't talk about it on the next slide. That's just a really easy sort of place to get misled diagnostically. You've got a patient who, whether you're a school nurse, like we heard a question from before, or you're hearing from the school nurse or from your teachers, oh, little Johnny is just not paying attention. He's fidgeting. He's falling asleep in class. And you know he has terrible eczema. You know he loses two to three hours of sleep a night. So you're like, oh, well, of course he's not paying attention in class. Of course he's tired. He's sleepy because of his eczema, maybe. Or maybe he has a different diagnosis that's actually treated differently. So it's an easy place to know. It's just an easy, uh, you've got a ready explanation for the symptoms that you're seeing before you. And there may actually be a different cause. So be aware of that. The yellow, those are sort of some intriguing things. We've learned a lot about uh, cardiovascular comorbidities and psoriasis, sort of thinking of that skin inflammation that you see in psoriasis as maybe systemic inflammation. And psoriasis is not as huge a leap because we've known about psoriatic arthritis forever, right? We've known it wasn't just skin deep. But we didn't know that there's inflammation that can actually lead to a greater risk of cardiovascular disease and, and cardiovascular events as adults, which is clearly true now with psoriasis. And as you see, yellow probably associated in patients with atopic dermatitis. So really interesting things. Um, and this is twitchy, so I hope I'm not, not uh, advanced accidentally. So here's where my conflict as the, uh, one of the producers of these guidelines comes in. The American Academy of Dermatology produced these comorbidities with a grading system that does not allow us to recommend screening. So we can only say, here's the data, these are your associations, they're good, they're strong, they're weak, whatever. But we were not able to say, this is what you should do because of them. That's why I put that asterisk there. These are my opinions. These are not the opinions of the American Academy of Dermatology. The ADHD situation we talked about. What about tween or teens? I didn't focus on the slide before, but depression uh, was green. Depression is associated with moderate to severe atopic dermatitis. Suicidal ideation um, is a risk. We all know if we see kids, this is an epidemic regardless of uh, underlying diagnosis. So if you've got a teen or a tween who's got bad eczema, you already know they're at risk because they're a teen or a tween and they live in this country or the world really in this day and age. And then they've got bad eczema as well be really careful with them, um, screen them. Um, we've taken to screening all patients over 11 years of age for, uh, with outpatient visits and to dermatology, and we're dermatologists. We're not thinking that we're gonna have as many positives as maybe some other clinics. I'm blown away every week by the number of 11 and 12 year olds with positive suicide screens. We're also doing positive, we're also doing social determinants of health screens. I saw some discussion of that earlier in this conference as well. Amazed how many, I'm not amazed, sadly re reminded how frequently the social determinant of health screen is positive in so many of our patients. Meaning that whatever we recommend or diagnose or say that should be done may not be able to be done because they're so uh, resource challenged. So all of these things are part of taking care of the whole patient, uh, but are certainly relevant with atopic dermatitis as well. We talked a little bit about the adult risk factors. Well, does that mean that we should try to treat more aggressively earlier to prevent a heart attack at 60 in our six-year-old with atopic dermatitis? It's getting to that point where that literature can support that conclusion in psoriasis. We're not there with atopic dermatitis. But I do think if you're on the fence in terms of uh, aggressiveness of therapy, this is not something that's inappropriate to have in the back of your mind. Do I articulate to parents that, oh boy, there's a risk of heart disease later in your child with eczema when you, can, when you can barely get across the message about proper bathing and moisturization in the time allotted? I don't. I think that's inappropriate. Um, if they ask me about it, I like being armed with the knowledge about the, this data to be able to say, yeah, it's, you know, let's not focus on that right now, but we're learning more about it. We'll, we'll maybe see cross that bridge if we ever come to it. In terms of infections, um, HSV is the big one to be aware of. That first picture I showed you, just that, that uh, really inflamed, exudative, weepy face of that, let's say, 16-month-old, super common scenario I'm sure you've all seen. And staff is usually the culprit. Try to parse the forest for the trees. The parents are going to come in and say, oh, little Johnny's flaring again. You've seen him 100 times, and you've, they've, it's been staff every time, and you've treated them with, let's say, Keflex and a topical steroid. They've gotten better. Great. Well, listen to the parents really carefully in that scenario. If they come in and say, yeah, little Johnny's flaring again, but something just seems a little different. 
They may not be able to say, I see little punched out erosions or little grouped vesicles in that mess, but you can. And so try to look in that mess of exudative weepy stuff and see if you can see the distinctive features of herpes. Because one out of three kids with eczema herpeticum are super, super infected with staph. So they've got both. So you see the crusting, you see the yellow impetigenization that makes you think it's staph, because it is, it's there. But underneath it all, and maybe the bigger deal, certainly the more risky thing medically, is the herpes uh, going unchecked, uh, because it can in patients with atopic dermatitis, so-called eczema herpeticum. So watch for that. So what's new therapeutically? We're gonna focus really on this next slide with the two, two drugs that I think you can prescribe tomorrow that can make a huge difference in your lives. You may or may not be as familiar with or comfortable yet, I'm not necessarily, with the newest of the new. So I want you to be aware of them, but I wanna talk specifically about the next two. If we go, let's see, we did. So these are new-ish. So dupilumab, I mentioned, was approved in 2017. Crisabarol, I'll say the brand name one time, Eucrisa, uh, was approved uh, two or three years ago. See, there's new-ish. But what's new? Um, these indications. Crisabarol was approved just this past year down to three months of age. That's amazing, right? That's a non-steroidal option down to three months of age when steroid phobia is at its absolute peak. What a glorious thing. The, the, the other non steroidal op options, I already mentioned them once, pemacrolimus and tacrolimus, neither are approved down below two years of age, so we've already got a difference there. And both of them have that boxed warning, which we all love so much, uh, talking about the risk of lymphoma and skin cancer and something that I think is actually totally inappropriate to label those drugs with, but I'm not making that choice, and that label is there, so we've got to deal with it. So parents who are steroid phobic and ask for a non-steroid, and then you offer up this bo boxed warning mentioning lymphoma and skin cancer, that I find that's not often the greatest balm for steroid phobia. So it's nice to have this product with no boxed warning down to three months of age. Well, where's the rub? There's always a rub. And here is the rub. It stings uh, an absurd number of patients you put it on. In the clinical trials, we were one of the sites for the clinical trials. One out of the seven kids we enrolled stung. Yeah, that's not, that's more than in the, the, the global picture. Put all the data together, 5%, less really, 4.4% stung. That's, that's not bad. Most things will do that. But in real life, it's way, way higher. I don't know how many of you guys have used this, but when I first got it, I had eczema as a kid. I haven't had it for years. I put it on my eyelids. It's the thinnest skin. If things sting, they're gonna sting there, and it, I had to wash it off right away. And so that's just, a, that's a fact. Um, the kids in whom it does not sting, brilliant, use it, I love it. If they can get it, it's newish and can be expensive, so there's that. But that's, that's the issue with this drug. How can you mitigate that? Well, what we usually would say, right, with topical steroids, get out of the ba bath, pat yourself dry, put the steroid on the inflamed part first, and then, you know, if you're using a steroid ointment, certainly, even if it's a cream, you don't need to use anything on that as far as a moisturizer. Put the moisturizer on the good skin, the steroid on the bad skin, right? Well, if you've got a stinging issue, then, or, or so I'll maybe back up and say, or if you really wanna um, just put moisturizer everywhere, fine, put the steroid first and the moisturizer on top, that's fine. You're gonna dilute it a little bit, but that's fine. Well, if you've got stinging issues, flip that. Purposely put the Vaseline on first and then the medicine on second. You're not gonna get the same efficacy, it's not gonna be as strong, but you're also gonna mitigate that stinging. Or put it in the refrigerator, that sometimes mitigates it. Or treat the inflamed skin with the steroid, get it better, and then use the non-steroid the second it starts to come back or don't even let it come back. The patients don't need you to tell them where the eczema comes back, it comes back in the same places every time, the elbow, the knees, the face, wherever it is. Say, okay, use this two to three times a week before it ever becomes a thing. And then it's probably not gonna sting and they're not gonna use too much and all is gonna be well. So lots of ways you can sort of mitigate the stinging issue. Oh, darn it. Um, Dupilumab. So let's just talk a little bit about that. The biggest new thing there, so approved in 2017 for adults, each year it's gone lower and lower. We've been a site for every one of those age groups at Children's, and the most recent is down to six months of age for a biologic injectable medicine. This is just phenomenal to me um, that that's, that's even a thing that the FDA has approved. It is 
they have done so because every age group has been remarkably clean safety profiles. Um, Dupilumab, as many of you probably know, we're talking about it because it's an eczema treatment. It's also an asthma treatment. So one of the most common comorbidities can be treated by the same drug. It's also being looked at for EOE, for um, allergies, for all sorts of different uh, atopic comorbidities. So dupilumab, that's one of the places that sort of distinguishes itself, itself from the next slide. I'm gonna show you with the newest of the new, um, which generally treat the eczema really well, but not necessarily anything else. So that's the biggest thing with dupilumab that's new, that the age of approval down to six months of age. The youngest I've treated is about one year. So even globally, with all the clinical trials, there were only 11 kids in less than two years of age in their trial. Only six on drugs, five on placebo, and yet it still got an indication for down to six months. So in the trial, only 11 kids younger than two years of age were treated with this in the clinical trial, and yet they still got an indication down to six months in age. It sort of speaks to the safety, the apparent safety, it tells me also I'm not super comfortable treating any patient population that has had only that number of patients studied. Uh, so I'm, I don't love to go there that young even though the indication is there. That lower bullet there is the biggest side effect that we see this, with this is the conjunctivitis. About one out of 10 patients can get conjunctivitis with dupilumab. Actually, the youngest of the young seemed to get it less. So it was only 5% in, in the six month to six year, six year group. The biggest deal with this is if they go into the treatment with eye problems. 8% of patients with eczema have a conjunctivitis, atopic uh, keratoconjunctivitis, or something going on with their eyes, at the very least rash around the eyes. Those are the kids where this is the biggest risk. So one out of 10 max maybe, um, if you've got a kid with nothing around the eyes and nothing in the eyes going in, probably way less than that. So do I send every kid I put on dupilumab to an ophthalmologist? No. The second they get skin, not skin symptoms, I do, or eye symptoms, excuse me, I do. I've had one kid who actually got a scarring ectropion from dupilumab, so it can be a problem. So this is a slide which I just still blows me away to even show you how many things are on it, given that story from two, the year 2000 to 2017 where there was nothing. Um, and the ones that we'll focus on, tralokinumab. So dupilumab is an IL-4, IL-13 blocker. Why do I say that? Only to tell you that tralokinumab is an IL-13 blocker. So very similar. If you have a kid who fails dupilumab, don't reach for tralokinumab. It's the same mechanism. It's possible they'll do better, but I wouldn't be as excited about it because it works in such a similar way. On the other hand, we'll go all the way down to the JAK inhibitors, a totally different pathway. Also note that one is injection, the biologics are injected, and the JAK inhibitors are oral. That's sort of been the holy grail for eczema therapy, right? A pill that makes it get better. And guess what? There's studies with the JAK inhibitors, the oral JAKs, that show decrease in itch in after the first dose. I mean, a lot of these things, methotrexate, here's your methotrexate, I'm sorry your eczema is so bad, it'll be better in six weeks. Yeah, you know, that's so frustrating to have to say. Cyclosporin a little better, but nothing is really like prednisone, which works really quickly. It's just not appropriate for chronic use until this. This is incredibly quick, and that's exciting. So, um, you patacitinib, abracitinib, two oral JAK inhibitors once a day. Um, you patacitinib is approved down to 12 years of age, so approved for kids down to 12 years of age, abro just for adults thus far. Um, Topical uh, ruxolitinib you see there in the yellow was approved just this past year as well. So here's the rub with that. It's a topical JAK inhibitor, so fine. Uh, that's all well and good. Mild to moderate. So all of the orals and the injectables are moderate to severe. This is mild to moderate. So you've got a kid who's, yeah, they've got enough disease that you're thinking about treating it, but it's mild to moderate. Guess what the price of a 30 gram tube is? $2,000. <laughs> So have I ever used this? No. Do I plan to ever use this? No. Um, it's, it's just ridiculous. Um, not only price period for no matter the severity, but for certainly for mild to moderate. On the other hand, the JAK inhibitors orally, the rub there is the boxed warning that goes along with them. So let's see if I can remember them all. Malignancy, infection, clots, uh, all-cause mortality. I think that is all-cause mortality. Oh, no, malignancy. Yeah, we got it all. So it's ridiculous. It's a very daunting boxed warning. But the thing about that is those were all generated from a different jack treating adults with rheumatoid arthritis and lots of comorbidities. So maybe apples to oranges. But the boxed warning is there. It's even there for the topical jack. So 
you're going to have to navigate that with, with parents and kids, and I have started to. I, I have used Upatacitinib. It's approved down to 12. I've fought, 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 and got it approved for a couple kids now who'd failed dupilumab, and it's, it worked incredibly quickly, so that was legit. That was real. I wasn't part of those trials, so it was my first experience, and um, I've, I think I've had five or six kids. It's worked on all of them. I've had two already where their lipids were just like, so that's the thing. So it's an oral, lovely. Kids who don't like shots are like, thank God, finally, I don't have to get a shot. And it's an oral, like, thank God, it's an oral. Well, we do have to check blood every month. I was like, okay, there's always something. So that's the downside with the oral, is you do need to do blood monitoring. So what do we monitor? CBC, uh, lipids, creatinine, and ALT. So really the only funky one, we accept CBC, creatinine, ALT, pretty much every oral medicine we use, but uh, that requires monitoring. But lipids are the big one to watch, and I've already sort of seen that become, become a thing. So. File these away. I just wanted you to know about them. I don't know how, how much you'll be prescribing them in the next year or two, but they're there and available. So just some questions still. Um, what parents ask, uh, because they're asking you, because <laughs> I know they're asking me, um, is bathing good or bad? Uh, what causes it? Uh, will my child grow out of it? Um, and is it due to a food allergy? I'm going to hit myself for just that last question because it uh, is PTSD, that, that uh, experience of trying to navigate that is so challenging. But just we'll kind of go through it a few slides in a minute. Good and bad. We'll talk about more about bathing. What causes it? It's multifactorial. Uh, will my child grow out of it? I don't use that language. 10%-ish of adults have atopic dermatitis. How much would you wager every single one of those adults with atopic dermatitis were told they would grow out of it? Probably every one. And that's not a very fun bargain for them to be sort of like, okay, I'm 30 now. <laughs> My pediatrician wouldn't have lied to me. So it, it's just be careful with that, right? Um, because it's setting up false hope for some. Um, it's not to say I don't like just beat parents down when they're just bedraggled from not sleeping at all because their child is, is so miserably affected and say, oh, they're not going to grow out of that. Um, I don't do that either. I will say your eczema will evolve with time. And they've already seen it, right? They've seen their baby with the facial stuff, the extensor stuff, and then they, that same baby three years later maybe has it in the crooks of their elbows. So I'll say, you know, it's going to change. And it may change so much you never knew you had it. They never knew they had it. Lovely. But that's what's going to happen. We can't predict exactly what's going to happen to your child, but, but let's do X, Y, and Z to try and do the best we can with it. So the role of bathing. So how many people in this room think moisturizing is good for atopic dermatitis? Every single one of us. That's the easiest question in the world. This, so there's no wrong answer to this next question, I'll say, if so don't know little alligator arms here. Um, how many people think, well, if it goes, bathing is good for atopic dermatitis? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I'm going to, actually, I will do an alligator arm. I just realized I can, because that's why I say no wrong answer. So here's why. So it, yes, is bathing good for atopic dermatitis? It's good or bad? Yes. Because if you bathe but don't moisturize afterwards, that's like the equivalent of that dry riverbed um, called the Colorado River, sadly. Um, that's, the, that's the situation where the skin just evaporates, and that evaporative water loss causes drying. On the other hand, if you bathe and then hydrate immediately afterwards, that's going to hydrate the skin, and that's going to make bathing beneficial. And this is how you convince parents when they've already read 10 different opinions, and yours is the third uh, medical opinion, and they're like, okay, sure, whatever you say, doc. Uh, you then say, okay, well, look at your child. Look at their skin. Look where it likes and look where it doesn't like. Places that moisturize themselves, the groin and the axilla, often are pristine. Sometimes I'll say, look here, and it's awful. I'm like, never mind. Let's not look there. <laughs> so it doesn't always work. But when it works, it can be really convincing. Uh, so uh, just make that point because it'll make it for you and it'll make your sell sales job a lot easier. Bleach baths, how many just out of curiosity incorporate bleach baths for their regimen? Yeah, I certainly do. Um, I don't so much, the original idea was that they were preventing staph infections and they do. That was the original outcome of that pediatrics paper if I quoted that one. But turns out the concentrations used are not antimicrobial, they're anti-inflammatory. And so therefore you decrease the inflammation and they don't get as many staph infections. So I like that because it's basically a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory treatment without a boxed warning. Uh, so I love bleach baths for that reason. You have to use them appropriately. You don't want little Johnny to be miserable, miserable, doing horribly, and then let's start the bleach bath, right? You want him to be at a relatively good place and do the bleach baths as prevention. 
twice a week is generally what we do. Uh, a teaspoon per gallon if you measure out your, your, your baths like I know all of you do. Uh, or if you don't, then a quarter cup max for uh, a full tub. Uh, that would be what we do. And the biggest difference between a bleach bath and a non-bleach bath is at the end, stand them up, rinse them off so the last water doesn't have any bleach in it. And then do your post-bath routine. I love them. They're not for everybody. I tell every patient, whether it's bleach baths or topical steroids or anything else, if you do X that I've told you and it doesn't work for little Johnny, let's talk about Y because uh, well, that doesn't make sense. Let's talk about Z. <laughs> let's talk about something else because eczema is incredibly individual. And so my job, our job, is to sort of equip parents with the sort of general principles like where does the skin like to be, what, the, the, what looks good, what moisturizers, how does it work, but not necessarily one size fits all because it doesn't. So this is uh, a complicated slide just to say there are a lot of things that go into atopic dermatitis. There's the genetics of it. There's the environment of it. There are pieces of this puzzle which you're not going to grow out of. So I kind of use this explanation when parents are focused, focused, focused on food allergy. And I'll say, okay, well, really, actually, there's this protein called filaggrin, which is deficient in your child's skin, almost certainly, and it's like caulk in their skin. And if there's not enough, then you, you have sort of leaky skin. Water gets out, so they get dry. Infections and allergens get in, so they have problems that way. And you're not going to grow out of that. Interestingly, it does get better as kids get older. Uh, and so that's part of the reasons why we do see kids who do grow out of it do so. But um, it's a multifactorial thing. Is atopic dermatitis an allergic disease or a disease with allergies? This is one sentence that incorporates uh, the bane of my existence. This is one cartoon which my nephew drew, which incorporates this idea. Credit to Gary Larson, um, what patients are told, Mrs. Smith, Joey has eczema, and it's very common. We do not know the cause. It can usually be safely and effectively managed. It's very important that we avoid irritants and moisturize his skin. Rarely, it can be associated with food allergies. What parents hear, Mrs. Smith, Joey has eczema, blah, 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 it's related to food allergies. <laughs> so that's, we've all had that experience. So. Um, this is why it's kind of like bathing. It's yes, it is in some one out of three kids with eczema have a food allergy. The problem is the vast minority of that 30% get, oh, miraculously better because you took away the eggs. It's just part of the story along for the ride, not necessarily driving the eczema. And that's why it's so hard because you can't just say no, you can't just dismiss it. Nor, of course we wouldn't, but my usual approach is, uh, is to say, take a good history. There's not a compelling history for food driving the eczema. I say, okay, let's not forget about it. Let's table that, do X, Y, and Z, come back in three weeks, let's see how you're doing. And if you're better having not changed a darn thing you're doing in your environment or your diet, that's a good test. And that's usually the one the parents will believe. So that's usually my approach. This is one thing that I, one point I wanna make, um, which is history guided testing can be a roadmap. Yes, it can, but parents are oftentimes after having that whole discussion, well, let's just test. I just wanna know. And I, what, what harm can there be? Well, there can be a lot of harm. That's how we develop a food allergy. Let's say little Johnny's taking eggs just fine. And the parents are like, yeah, but I could be the eggs. He's still got his eczema. I don't know, he eats lots of things. And it's like, okay, let's test for eggs. We test for eggs, RAS test six for eggs. And yet he's taking eggs every day, no problem, happy as a clam. Uh, and then they're like, well, sure enough, we're going to take away those eggs. That's how he develops an egg allergy, because he's no longer seeing that protein. And so you can create a food allergy with this inappropriate testing and restriction of diet of a food that they're already taking well. So that's that, that's that bottom paper, oral food challenge failures among foods restricted because of atopic dermatitis. So there's plenty of literature to support this. This is just the whole peanut story, that fascinating story about we used to avoid peanuts, now we're saying feed peanuts to patients with atopic dermatitis. This was just an NIH um, addendum to the food allergy guidelines in 2010, which just shows how to approach this. And so you've got this slide, um, and it just talks about whether it's RAS tests on the left or prick tests on the right. If they're negative, then if you're comfortable, if they're comfortable, you can try introducing uh, peanut protein at home. And if, if you do it, do it three times a week or more. Repeated exposure. That's how they're going to develop tolerance. You do it once and you do it again in three months or something, they're probably going to develop an allergy. So if they're on the other end of the spectrum, a class six or a uh, greater than eight millimeter wheel, then maybe they're already sensitized, maybe not the best idea, but this is where your allergy colleagues or possibly uh, us can, can help. 
provider questions. You may say, that's not my question. Well, it's somebody's question, darn it. So the safe use of topical steroids. Um, too much, what's too much, what's too strong? Um, I get that question a lot. What about those black, we talked a little bit about the, the box warning with tacrolimus and pomacrolimus, so we won't cover that. And we talked a bit about the bottom already. But this is sort of just some simple instructions, I think, which really help with steroid phobia. Don't just say it can thin the skin. They've heard that, they've read that. Uh, what helps is to say, okay, number one, what does thinning of the skin look like? And so what I will usually do, especially with the little ones, again, that's when fish story phobia is the biggest deal, is look to the temples. There's always tight skin there, so you can see you have to sort of strain your eyes. Oh, it's a vein there, right? If you look at the wrist, even in the child, sometimes it's just too obvious, but you look at that little faint blue line, oh, it's a vein. Right, yeah, so you point that out to the parents. Have you ever used topical stories there? No, that's just their skin. Okay, so Think about that. If you start to see that in a place where you do use topical steroids and you have never seen that before, maybe that's the first sign of thinning of the skin. Guess what? It's totally reversible. You stop, it goes away. If you didn't listen to that or you uh, didn't see that, it was too subtle, then you treat, treat, treat. And I show them the back of my hand, my 58-year-old sun-damaged North Carolina reared hand with that atrophic paper, cigarette paper, yucky atrophy. And I show them that, and they're like, oh, dear God, I would never miss that. And, and I say, that's reversible in your child if you treat it with topical steroids. And they're like, oh, okay. And so they own that side effect, and they, it sort of demystifies it so that then they can do what you want them to do with the topical steroid. So I think that's reasonable. And then I also have to close that by saying, if you, don't, if you treat through that, you get a stretch mark, and that's a scar. So I love that you're worried about this problem. It is not something to be trivialized, but it is something to contextualize and be able to approach in a reasonable way. Um, I don't say you can only use this for half the month, uh, topical steroid, that you know, eczema doesn't abide a half the month schedule. So I say try to overall have a day or two off for every day or two use steroids once things are under control and after that first burst of getting things better and then try to get breaks. If you can't get that many breaks, well then that's where we need a non-steroidal or something else. Touch test, what do I mean by that? So many kids get post-inflammatory hypopigmentation like you see on that picture, and it looks abnormal, right? And so to parents, they're like, oh, well, he's still got the eczema, let's keep on putting on top of steroid. Well, that's just healing skin, right? That's not active inflammation, that's just post-inflammatory. So I tell them if they close their eyes and rub their hand on it, you can't feel it, it's not red and it doesn't itch, just moisturize it. And that's a really tactile and tangible way for parents to know when to stop using topical steroids. So with that, let's see, those are just pictures of what we just talked about. So that's just a slide of a standard thing that I will write for, for a first visit, maybe mild to moderate kid. Some hydrocortisone ointment for the face, some trimsolone 0.1% ointment for the body with all those caveats, and then maybe some bleach baths, high petrolat, omnipiercin if there's open skin, hydroxazine if there's sleep loss. Here's another sort of myth about eczema. Antihistamines don't treat the itch of eczema. They treat the sleep loss of eczema by knocking kids out. If kids have concurrent allergic rhinoconjunctivitis, treats that, great. And sometimes that can be so bad, next thing you know they're itching here too, and so it is a vicious cycle. Great, it treats that. But if you have a child who has just eczema on their arms and legs, say, and you give them cetirizine, a non-sedating antihistamine for the itch of that eczema, if it's working, it's a placebo effect if you're to believe any of the trials that have ever looked at this. So, warts, now that we've covered eczema in a mere good God, okay. Um, Let's talk about warts a little bit since we see these as well. And the thing about eczema is there's a lot new. That's why I did want to spend actually most of the time talking about that. These others, uh, not as much, but we'll talk about them anyway. So this is what I want to talk about as far as what's new with warts because it's, it's kind of new-ish if we'll ever see it. I'll push it again. There we go. Um, intralesional candida. Do any of you guys do this? Candida antigen like we used to use for TB tests and that sort of thing. So it's actually a pretty good treatment for warts. Um, and this is what you do. Um, you basically, and these are the studies, the sort of systematic reviews, you know, 23% to 95%, that's a really reliable range, isn't it, to, to reassure that it's gonna work. But I will tell you, in my experience, it's, it's one of the better treatments. It's painful, it's a shot, it's not for everyone, but a motivated child old enough um, to do it, it can be really helpful. You basically get the candida antigen, just as listed there uh, below, the candin, um, a 27 gauge needle, I will use emla cream, and I will go, if this is the wart, 
I kind of go in parallel just so I'm getting the antigen right into the, just below the base of the wart into the dermis so the immune system sees it. And so then the immune system says, oh, Canada, that's kind of supposed to be in the mouth or other places in the gut. That's not supposed to be on skin. So the immune system attacks the candida and friendly fire kills the wart. Um, I do it uh, one shot, like if they've got them on both hands, I'll maybe do one wart on each hand. You don't have to treat every wart. That's torture. Uh, but one wart on each hand uh, and then see them again in six weeks, do it again. I'll do this like with freezing up to four times. And if it's not worked after the fourth time, move on. Um, I, I do that with freezing as well. We'll talk about that. Uh, next. Parents questions, can't you just cut it out? Uh, I suppose you could, but there are little viral particles at the border you don't see and you cut it out and next thing you know you've got wart in a scar and that's even worse. So I use that, that explanation for why we don't just cut it out. And they say, well, but my cousin had it cut out and it went away for good. And I was like, well, they were lucky um, because it's just not, I've seen too many warts and scars and it's unpleasant. What's next? What's next? So just the, the treatment, there are no great treatments for warts. Nothing's perfect. That's why there are a million of them. So just match the treatment to the child. If the child's not bothered by it and it's the parent sort of driving the show, as sometimes it is, I, I will not do something that's going to hurt that kid. I won't freeze it. Um, if the kid clearly is impacted by it, sometimes you don't know, of course. There's always gray areas, and so you, we always have to use our judgment there. But um, if there are comorbidities, if my child has diabetes and they've got a big wart on their foot, am I going to freeze that, make a big hole in their foot? Of course not. So there are situations where I would not do uh, certain treatments. But um, I don't excise them. Other ones, cantheridin, we're going to talk about in a moment, so I'll skip over that. Amiquimod, also brand name Aldera. Amiquimod is a topical immunomodulator, generates interferons in the skin. It's FDA approved for genital warts, so I always, you know, phone call prophylaxis is part of our job. So I will always tell them that on the front end to say, yes, it's FDA approved for genital warts. No, these warts on their hands have nothing to do with, the genital, wart, with genital warts in your child. It's a cream that treats warts. Um, so, uh, always talk about that ahead of time. Cimetidine, um, also uh, known as Tagamet, uh, 30 to 40 mg per kg divided BID. I swear uh, it works in some kids. Um, it, studies say it's no better than placebo, but when I've got nothing, I'm, diabetes, whatever the reason I can't do the other things, and I've got lots of warts, maybe it's too much to freeze or inject, I think this is a reasonable thing to try. Squaric acid is sort of a derm thing, kind of a painting on an allergen onto the wart so they have an allergic reaction to their wart. Um, so if a local dermatologist could probably guide you through that if you're interested and then the candle we talked about. This is um, just the over-the-counter regimen. So parents say, oh, we've done everything. Yeah, we know, we've done the over-the-counter stuff. And then you ask them how they've done it and they put on a little tape that fell off two minutes later and that was their treatment. And so what I will say is don't use the tapes. There's nothing wrong with them. They just fall off two minutes later. So we will use the liquid wart medicines, soak the wart first, put the liquid wart medicine on after the wart is, dry, after the wart is really hydrated, let it soak in, put on something occlusive that can be, a band, if it's a Band-Aid, make it the sticky part of the Band-Aid, not the cloth part, so it's just like <laughs> stuck on, leave it on overnight, take it off, there's a lot of dead skin then, Use a dedicated, no, you don't file the wart, file your nails, file the wart, that's dumb. Um, use a dedicated file to file off the dead skin in the morning and then repeat that every morning. That's pretty labor intensive. So sometimes I'll go through that process and they're like, no. <laughs> and that's fine. I, you know, that's good to know. And then you don't recommend that. Um, they will say, okay, we'll do it, but when, then they'll go home and they'll do it, and they're so darn sick of doing it by the time the wart finally gets flat that they stop the second it's flat, and then it comes back. And they're like, and so I always tell them, if you look at a wart, it, this is a foot, so you don't see the fingerprints as much. You don't see the dermatogloves. But if you imagine a fingerprint kind of go doo, 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 stop and then start on the other side, if there's a bump there, you don't need that sort of graphic. But when it's flat, you do. And what I want to see is those fingerprints reconnect all the way through the wart, and then they're done. And before that, keep treating. So that's a good way to make them so they don't stop treating too soon. So for treatments we said, be very, very careful with darker skin types. It's not at all hard to freeze a permanent area of depigmentation that's not coming back. So under treat because you don't want to treat and leave a permanent problem for a transient issue. So the wart's gonna go away if you wait long enough. The depigmentation if you create it is not. So be very careful. Be very careful on the proximal nail folds. That's where your nail is born. You can freeze the matrix so hard that the nail grows abnormally permanently. So those are two, two caution places. 
And I just buff up my Q-tips to match the size of the wart. And because otherwise you're like dipping in, dipping out, it's a pain in the rear end. So if you just buff up the Q-tip and get enough cotton on there, then you can do a much more sustained freeze if that's appropriate. How many seconds? Well, what a question you've asked. Uh, <laughs> this is my plant in the audience. Thank you. Uh, no, that's awesome. I love it. Um, so there you go. So, but it depends. It's a great question because it depends. On the foot, I'll do maybe 10, four 10 second cycles. On the eyelid, if I did that, their eyelid would fall off. So it, it totally matters um, where. Um, and so do be careful about. Consequence of an inadequate freeze, you get a ring work, uh, which is meant you froze the middle really well, but the outside not so good. Oddly, my patients are never satisfied by this. <laughs> molluscum, how are we doing? Okay, molluscum. Contagiosum, so the friend of the wart, the friend of no one but the wart. Um, this is uh, uh, something that can look a lot like a wart, but you'll never see it on the palms and soles. So if you're not sure it's a wart, it's a molluscum, I'm not sure. You won't see molluscum on the palms or the soles because we don't have hair follicles on our palms or soles. So that's one clue. I'm gonna jump ahead because I think this is really important. If you, you may feel differently, but I, I feel like when I see molluscum in the genital area of a child, I think about things beyond the molluscum, but I don't think long about them. Molluscum love to be in moist environments, axilla, the groin. That's just where they like to be, among other places. If I see a wart in the genital area of a child, chances are it was benignly transmitted from the wart on their hand or their parent's hand or whatever. So that certainly is not prima facie evidence of non-accidental trauma or abuse, but I just think longer about it, and I explore it a little more, and I say, oh gosh, does anyone at home have warts? Or, oh, let's look for warts on the hand, child of the hand. I just think about it more. The trick is that molluscum in the genital area, particularly the intergluteal cleft, because it's sort of const under constant pressure, can become very filiform and very spiky looking, and not like a typical dome-shaped pearly papule. Well, that's derm speak, don't you love it? Uh, not like a typical molluscum. And so you look at it and you're like, oh, that's spiky, that's filiform, that's a wart. I'm going to think more about abuse. Well, just be aware that oftentimes molluscum can look like that there. So if you do think about them differently in that location and that matters, just be aware of that. So you can't prescribe this yet, but I felt duty bound to talk about what's new. That's the name of the conference. Uh, this will be available soon. And it's fabulous. I mean, it's nice to have something new for finally from Luscom. This is a topical nitric oxide product. This is a Jamaderm paper just this last July, like last month, very, very new. Um, but it's looking very promising. So this will be out there soon enough, but you can't prescribe this now, nor can you prescribe um, I think it's my next slide, this Verica product. Um, but it's, it, this is Cantheridin. I'm sure you're all familiar with Cantheridin. You may use Cantheridin. I used to use Cantheridin before my hospital said no. You may not because it's not FDA approved. But it's actually a really good treatment when used appropriately. Uh, that paper down there we did in, years ago that showed, you know, it was a wonderful treatment in these 300 kids that we treated with, with uh, Cantheridin. This is going to be a single-use, in-office Cantheridin product that you use um, to treat molluscum. And it's been real promising, but they're struggling to get the FDA approval. And, I, you know, you never know why that is, whether it's something trivial or something really not trivial. So we'll see about that. I talked about that. Molluscum mimics um, keratosis pilaris. Um, you can see uh, on the cheeks, you typically the outer arms, uh, sometimes the thighs. Um, lichen nitidus is a version of eczema, but it's a very follicular version of eczema. It looks almost like perma goosebumps. And it's much more grid-like, as you see there, as opposed to molluscum, which, yeah, can look a little grid-like, but they're a little more irregular. So if you see something that looks that regular, um, it's probably not molluscum. And here's another example. Um, I'm gonna, oh, that's, we'll talk first about the treatments, um, which you guys know, they're not, none are perfect. Um, if I can leave them alone, I leave them alone. That's the best treatment of all because they do go away. Parents sometimes don't like that. Um, so uh, no school op options, nothing like that. Um, it shouldn't be a limit to kids going to school. Um, but we will cure, cure at them. You can cure at them off if you want in a motivated child. It works great, but it can be painful. Uh, we do use EMLA. Or you can freeze them. So uh, this is what I wanted to say is you'll sometimes see molluscum getting infected. That's not an infection. That's an inflamed molluscum. It's very localized, confined to the lesion itself, um, and sometimes is referred to as the boat sign 
um, that may be the second or next slide or the second, there we go, the B-O-T-E, the beginning of the end, um, because it's an immune response, right? And so there's this idea that it's your immune system finally recognizing this infection and it's gonna go away. So I've seen patients back 10 months later, well, that, that boat sign's still clicking along. <laughs> like, so it's a very protracted end, but it doesn't always necessarily work that way, but this almost always does. If you see a child who has molluscum, there you see those inflamed molluscum on the arm, but then they got this, they don't quite look like molluscum, do they? On the extensor elbows, on the cheeks, they're inflamed papules, but they're not quite the same. This is a Giannotti crosti like reaction to molluscum. We usually think of it to other viruses because that's where we usually see it. That's a systemic immune response. This is a darn good boat sign. This, this boat's leaving soon, so you can rely on this one. Okay, now, do we have time to talk about acne? Maybe, just a second. Um, at least the new stuff, because all the new stuff I'm going to say here for acne, that, you know, you treat acne every day, and there's not been anything new forever, and a lot of these are like me too, but one of them actually is quite new. Um, that Clascoderone cream we'll talk about in a moment is new. Minocycline is minocycline. It's just now you can use it topically. We've never been able to do that before. That's kind of nice. And then a fourth generation tetracycline. My God, tetracyclines are like razor blades. Like, they got 16 blades. This is going to really, really work well. There's always, there's like a new tetracycline every other month, and now we have yet another one. This is the minocycline foam, um, approved down to nine years of age, which is good. Uh, low systemic exposure, the, f the foam is flammable, that's not as good. Uh, but, but we, hopefully they don't have open flames in their bathroom when they're putting on their acne medicine, but do be aware. Um, Clascoderone, this is truly new. This is a topical antiandrogen, right? This is how Accutane works. Accutane is brilliant. It just has a lot of baggage. This is a topical Accutane in a sense. It doesn't work that well, I, I'm here to tell you. But it, that's how it works. It can be used both, you might say, oh, antiandrogen, should we use it in boys? You can, boys and girls, 12 and older, um, twice a day. I don't think I put that here. This is twice a day. I like to be very specific, so avoid larger areas. Good luck with that. Uh, that is a recommendation purely to say you don't want them putting this on head to toe. You can use this in acne areas, face, chest, back, no problem, twice a day. That's the, I'm not going to spend any time on this. The biggest difference here, so it's a tetracycline approved down to nine years of age, um, and it does seem to have decreased risks of, you know, it used to call P acnes, now it's C acnes, cutobacterium. Uh, that's probably the biggest difference. This is probably the one I use the most of these. It's not new, um, but what's new is how much dermatologists use it. Um, just for women, just for girls, um, it's an antiandrogen. Um, so if you've got a history of a female patient who has hormonally driven acne, how do you know? A history. History's not always perfect. How do you then know? Loves to hug the outer jaw and the neck. If you see really predominant acne in those locations in a, a teen or tween uh, girl or a, a young woman, uh, think about hormonally driven acne and think about this as a treatment. Um, I don't check potassium levels. You know, it's a potassium-sparing diuretic, of course. I, in a healthy child, I don't check potassium levels. Some do. Um, it is not, would not be inappropriate, but I do not. Um, Long-term safety, um, it's actually uh, quite reassuring. There have been a number of papers recently have looked, looked at this. You see the bottom bullet, a uh, good number of patients in this um, uh, study discontinued due to side effects, but they're usually sort of nuisance side effects, some breast tenderness, uh, perceived weight gain. It's not generally something that happens with this drug, uh, but uh, it can be a very effective treatment. Um, minimal impact on blood pressure. I told you don't check potassium. Um, yeah. So um, how are we doing? Oh, I think my timer's about to go off. Um, so 15-year-old girl with acne on the chest and face, what are some options um, just to kind of go through what we have new and old? Will it scar? Is it due to food? No. Um, it, she eats a lot of sugar? Fine. Uh, is Accutane safe? Uh, yes, but qualified. Um, so these are sort of the things. Will that scar on the left? No. Uh, will that scar on the right? Absolutely. How can you know since you see us? Well, these are obvious examples, but how do you know in the middle of that bell-shaped curve? Um, ask that question, do they hurt? Do the lesions hurt? And if they hurt, it tells you there's inflammation at a point in time, maybe not today, maybe not what you see, inflammation deep enough that it could scar. Doesn't mean it will, but that's one of those tipping points for me. If they say, yes, it, it oh, it, I have to sit in school and class and it hurts on my back when I lean back against the chair. Yeah, I mean, that's, I worry more about that. I might be more aggressive. Um, does it cause by food? Not unless they smear the pizza on their face. Uh, soft litter, trounderry, and, and sugar. 
Is Accutane safe? Yes. Does this have side effects? Absolutely. Um, the biggest ones, uh, the most real ones, it's your teratogen for sure. Uh, that's just a no-brainer. You can't get pregnant on this medicine. It can cause hyperdriglyceridemia, but in my experience, the JAK inhibitors, I'm already more worried about triglycerides than I have ever been with, with Accutane. Uh, excuse me, with isotretinoin, that's the generic name. Um, the mood issues, um, I cannot, if a patient asks me, does this associated with mood, um, say no. The vast majority of patients who have mood changes, their mood gets better because their acne is so much better. However, I have had a few patients, for sure, who I just, uh, you know, they, they didn't feel quite the same. And I didn't know if I was creating that problem because I have a very careful discussion about uh, depression, suicidal ideation, and suicide before putting a patient on this drug. Aha. Um, I will finish my thought. Um, very careful discussion. And so such a careful discussion, I sometimes worry, about, like, oh, good God, I'm going to get so depressed on this medicine. And then, you know, you, you might create that problem. But um, nevertheless, we just have to take it super, super seriously. And probably the, the, the pearl I will, man, pearl to me, maybe not you, that, that what I tell them about this is I'll say, you know, if you're on Accutane and you have a bad day, which you will because you're a human, tell your mom, tell your dad, tell your best friend, tell somebody that you had a bad day. Even if you know exactly why you had a bad day, you played lousy in soccer, your best friend gave you a bad TikTok, I don't know what the hell, but it, whatever it was, just tell somebody. Because if it's the medication, there is a thing known as drug-induced depression, it's very real, I just don't think it's so real with this drug, that if it's the drug, it, it is no longer you making those decisions. It is the drug. And so you cannot rely on your teenage invulnerability to save you. Because if you say, oh, I'll tell, you know, if I, feel, if I still feel bad in a week, I'll tell somebody. No, you can't do that. You have to tell them the day you feel bad so they can check on you so it doesn't snowball. And then it's the drug and you don't tell someone you've got a problem. So that, I always go through that little chat.